and in this session professor devesh kumar avasti university of petroleum and energy studies dehradun will deliver his talk on the topic role of nanotechnology in materials for energy i'm feeling extremely privileged to introduce our eminent speaker professor avasti after completing his phd in 1982 professor avasti has served in defense research development laboratory hyderabad as scientist b nuclear science center as scientist d and which is currently known as inter university accelerator center iuac uh, located in the jawaharlal nehru university delhi he superintended as scientist h head of material science and radiation biology at iuac delhi in december 2015 and then uh, he joined mit university noida as director uh, of director of uh, the directorate of engineering and technology and then mit institute of nanotechnology he joined as dean r&d at the university of petroleum and energy studies upes dehradun in the september 2020 uh, dr avasti has more than 700 research publications and his edge index is 53 he authored a book on swift heavy ions in material engineering and nano structuring published by springer he authored several chapters for books and edited several conference proceedings for international journals he is a phd students and currently has four phd students i request participants to please mute themselves he authored several book chapters and uh, edited several conference proceedings for international journal he supervised 32 phd students and currently has four phd students his main research interest main uh, research interest they are uh, iron beams for analysis modification of materials synthesis and engineering for nanostructures carbon nanostructure fullerene cnt and graphene surface and interface modification by iron beams plasmonics surface enhanced raman scattering thermoelectric material edge generation by photoelectrochemical splitting of water radiation tolerance of structured materials for nuclear reactor application of nanostructured material in biosensing gas sensing and water remediation he nucleated research programs with national and international collaborations in the field of electronics sputtering iron beam mixing and iron beam based synthesis of nanostructures two major research projects out of the several projects implemented by him are under intensifying research in high priority area scheme and uh, another nano mission scheme funded by department of science and technology Dr Avasti has several international collaborations with research group in NIMS Subuka Japan CSNSM Orsay Kiel University LMU Munich and MPI Stuttgart Germany St Petersburg Russia and Padova University Italy he is founder president of iron beam society of india he is among top 2% researchers of the world as per a recent report by stanford university He is a fellow of Institute of Physics UK. He is associate editor of International Journal Radiation Effects and Defects in Solids by Taylor and Francis, and has been in editorial board of International Journal Vacuum by Elsevier. He is also member of several international conference committees. Uh, sir, we are really delighted to have you among us. Uh, now I request you to kindly uh, start your session. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Kriti. Uh, I am audible. I am audible. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes sir, you are audible. audible. Okay. Okay. So first of all, I will uh, compliment the uh, organizer, uh, Dr. Ankur Jain, and his team to pick up uh, such an interesting topic and which is of uh, tremendous interest and uh, utilization of nanomaterials. and instrumental technique for energy applications is very very apt in the current scenario and it will remain so in future as well so i am today now focusing on uh, let's say role of nanotechnology in materials for energy 
So materials for energy is a very, very vast field, but I will pick up some of the example which I have been involved in the research with. So this is the this is the plan of my lecture. So uh, introduction, I'll go through that, uh, what are the materials for energy? And uh, at some of the uh, research, I have used the ion beam. So I'll give some example of that, you, how they are utilized in this area. Uh, may I request the, some participants are not actually uh, muted. So if they can do so, that will be good for all. Yeah, so thank you all. Iron beam synthesis and processing of thermoelectric materials, the role of nanostructures in materials for energy as such, for example, in thermoelectric materials, fuel cell, photoelectrochemical, splitting of water to get hydrogen, and hydrogen is also energy, thermal storage, materials for nuclear reactor. And so I'll give some glimpses of UPS and its research activities and summary. So in materials for energy, there are a large number of uh, materials which could be utilized for, uh, for the energy. And solar cell is uh, the most common one. And uh, thermoelectric materials, uh, thermoelectric materials is the one in which you use the waste heat for uh, converting that waste heat into the uh, uh, electric power. And uh, you, there is a lot of wastage of heat and uh, this can be utilized in the in the uh, positive manner. For example, this kind of thing is currently being utilized in some cars. In the cars, uh, especially uh, uh, the uh, Benz uh, and the uh, other German cars have, and other uh, company cars also have uh, fitted with the thermoelectric materials at the engine. And engine goes uh, temperature goes very high, so with the temperature difference. Actually, they utilize this, uh, they generate the power, and that is utilized within the, uh, the for lighting and for playing the, uh, the, the audio and something kind of things within the uh, car, actually. So there is a waste heat, but that is utilized within the car. So these are the directions. There could be many such examples. Uh, then hydrogen storage. Hydrogen is coming in a big way, uh, and... Uh, Hydrogen ha can be used, used for energy, and you can run the uh, engines with the hydrogen. Uh, but the main problem is that how to store it. And uh, so there are uh, hydrogen storage materials, and uh, there is a lot of research in that direction. And uh, hydrogen is uh, inflammable also. So there are there, there is a need of uh, development of hydrogen sensor. So I am not discussing all, the, all those things, but I'm just telling what are the latest things there photo spreading of water again to get hydrogen so this uh, hydrogen uh, is used uh, again for energy and basically photo spreading of water means that you are using water to produce hydrogen but then you are using the solar light one can actually use the power uh, electricity to produce hydrogen but that's not the uh, right way because if you are using uh, electricity to produce hydrogen, then actually you are using the electricity itself. So uh, there are ways that you have some materials which are kept in contact with water and in presence of light, they produce hydrogen. So that is what it is called photo splitting of uh, water. Then photocatalytic activities. There are a lot of photocatalytic activities and the uh, photo splitting water is one of the examples. So where actually you use the photons instead of uh, uh, electricity for catalytic process, supercapacitors, fuel cells, and thermal storage. And there is a lot to do. Uh, there is a lot of energy from the nuclear reactors and so on. But there are need of uh, certain further development in uh, the materials being used in the structure of uh, uh, nuclear reactors. So these are the red areas are some of the areas which I'll be uh, discussing here today. So first one is the thermoelectric material. So we are knowing that it generates electricity from heat or vice versa. So if you have uh, uh, a, a material 
which is at a temperature difference uh, delta t then due to temperature difference a potential difference is created and that's what the feedback effect is delta v by delta t as shown in the figure and then peltier effect is just opposite of it that means in the same thing if you apply the voltage difference it can create the temperature difference so this uh, this is then utilized for cooling the uh, devices or cooling the uh, cooling devices one can make out of this so this is the importance of uh, thermoelectric material now what are the challenge uh, thermoelectric efficiency of material is quantified by uh, figure of merit and this is defined by s square sigma t divided by k and s is feedback coefficient sigma is electrical conductivity k is thermal conductivity so the aim is the efficiency to be increased that means that is to be increased and to do that actually one should have a large feedback coefficient high electrical conductivity and poor thermal conductivity are required so if uh, the the problem is that uh, all three quantities are co correlated and are difficult to optimize independently so if you see in this equation if you try to increase uh, sigma then actually k also increases and therefore that sigma by k hardly any change uh, occurs so that is what the strategy i will discuss here so uh, basically aim is to min, uh, maximize sigma by k but then uh, uh, how to do this the minimization of thermal conductivity k without affecting electrical conduct conductivity the thermal conductivity is actually given by addition of two things that means uh, it is a combination of uh, the electronic uh, conductivity that means which is due to electrons and holes and uh, the other one is due to phonons traveling through the lattice which is called k phonon so this is the phononic uh, thermal conductivity so but then uh, by the franz law the thermal uh, electronic thermal conductivity is uh, is uh, equal to l sigma t well uh, that means ke is uh, dependent on sigma okay so if ke is dependent on sigma then this means then when i am trying to minimize k then i should not actually uh, touch the ke but then i should try to minimize k phonon if i reduce the k phonon then the uh, electrical conductivity is not altered because uh, in in the equation earlier i have shown here that uh, if actually uh, the electrical conductivity is uh, is decreased with k then overall there is no net gain so the idea is that the sigma remains the same but k is reduced so k is reduced by this way that you reduce the k phonon because if you reduce the ke then then actually the sigma also gets reduced so hence the strategy is to minimize the k phonon so that is the most important part in in its uh, planning and strategizing the experiment so what are the different strategies to lower lattice thermal conductivity so one can actually distort the unit cell so you can see the picture if you distort it uh, you have a, by point defect or vacancy or allowing then the thermal conductivity is lowered or you have some complex crystal that means you have a mole molecule within within that molecule you have some atoms sitting inside so these are also called rattling molecules and this uh, and the third way third way is to use nano composite so in nano composite actually these are the nano materials which are utilized for uh, for uh, basically uh, in nano composite means basically you have some matrix in which you, there are some nano materials which are embedded so this is the another way so nano structures are uh, do help in lowering the lattice thermal conductivity now how to actually achieve this so one ion beams uh, irradiation is one of the uh, method for that and uh, on the right hand side i have shown that you have a thin film on a substrate so uh, if you do the ion beam uh, irradiation then this is a localized energy deposition and uh, uh, so this energy deposition is the electronic or nuclear uh, ankur you want to say something uh, uh, 
Is it? Uh, I'm I'm audible. Uh, it appears to me that you wanted to say something. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Please it's fine. Okay, 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 fine. So iron beam irradiation actually results in either a defect creation. That means point defects, cluster of defects, or columnar defects are created, or there could be phase transformation and interface mixing. And there could all it also can lead to nanostructuring. In all three cases, actually the, we are minimizing the thermal conductivity. And if we are minimizing thermal conductivity, that means uh, it results in more of the phonon scattering. Therefore, it will be increased in ZT. That means increase in efficiency. So that is the approach we have been taking in uh, examples which I am going to show. So this is uh, some of the thing, uh, especially of the ion beams. Uh, I have just shown that uh, ion beam has a capability of uh, controlled defect creation. It can also do annealing or defect. And uh, it is also used for characterization of materials. And one actually deposits the huge energy density in localized region. And this uh, energy density is quite large. But this material actually undergoes a fast cooling and this cooling rate is as high as in 10 to power 14 Kelvin per second is a too high value. And that happens in a picosecond time and uh, within a very narrow cylinder of five nanometer or so. So materials becomes in extremely under extreme condition. And uh, these are uh, some specific features of uh, ion beam which are utilized in different ways. So next slide actually shows that uh, these features are utilized in uh, uh, Bragg peak that useful of radiation therapy. These have been useful in radiation therapy. It has uh, been useful in phase transformation. High temperature and high pressure are created. And because of high temperature and or pressure, the phase transformation occurs. And uh, these sign beams are also utilized for simulating the conditions in laboratory for the reactor environment. So I'll show some example. There are some ongoing projects we have with IIT Delhi and BRC, Bombay. Then space radiation, there have been experiments by ISRO that uh, there are satellites actually which do go uh, bad or means uh, they are uh, affected by the space radiation. There are some electronic chips there which are affected by the uh, space radiation and then satellite goes out of control. So that means those uh, sensitive chips are to be tested beforehand and this is done by the uh, ion beams from the accelerator. Then tokamak uh, plasma reactor, there have been experiments by IPR researchers. And now we also have got one project with uh, IPR, that's the Institute of Plasma Research, to test the plasma facing material for uh, uh, their stability against the ions from plasma. Actually, metroid impact on Earth also could be generated at a micro or nano scale by the ion beam. So they have similar effect, and uh, this uh, metroid is a very huge coming on Earth. But that could be uh, if you uh, actually reduce in dimensions drastically, then it is the equivalent to one ion actually hitting the surface of a uh, material, and it is producing a a, uh, a, a basically hillock or uh, a ditch kind of thing uh, at the place of the hit. Uh, that is what has been observed when they uh, at the impact of the earth by the metroid the there is a lot of uh, erosion of the material from that place so uh, there are similarities there now these are some basic uh, things about the ion beams i can skip that because uh, uh, this is probably not needed but i will say that uh, Ion beam synthesis of thermoelectric material, we have tried by ion beam mixing or ion beam induced mixing. So ion beam mixing is a phenomena that you have uh, a, a uh, thin layer on some substrate or another film, and then you uh, irradiate by the ion beam. Then the materials for the two uh, films, they get intermixed at the face, at the interface. And that's what called ion beam mixing. And you can get some new material at the interface. But if the same thing you get uh, by annealing 
uh, after radiation, then it is called ion beam induced mixing. So I have some examples show that, and this is what uh, I just now explained. In the first top picture, you have one film uh, of a color sitting on another film layer two of different color. And these three arrows, they are showing that the ion beam has passed. And along the ion path, there has been a lot of disturbances. And uh, if uh, this gets mixed uh, just after a radiation, then it is the third picture at the bottom. Uh, it becomes like this. But sometimes it happens that there are defects created, but there is no mixing like in the middle picture. But then if you anneal it further by uh, thermal annealing, then again, it results in complete mixing. So these are the two different ways one could get uh, ion beam mixing or ion beam induced mixing. This is one example of uh, uh, terulium film on uh, lead oxide, which is a bilayer. And now it is irradiated by silver ions at 10 to the power 14 ions per cent square. So you see the X-ray uh, uh, diffraction pattern that uh, you have uh, at the bottom most one uh, is the pristine one where you see terulium, lead oxide, uh, X-ray diffraction peaks. But as you irradiate, you start getting lead telluride phase. And uh, top curve is shown that which is the pristine film which is annealed. And if you anneal it, then uh, actually mixing is not taking place. Rather, uh, it is uh, lead oxide formation is there, which is stronger. So this means that uh, uh, with the ion irradiation, we are able to produce the mixing of terulium and lead, and it forms lead telluride. And the same thing is proven by the selected area diffraction pattern shown in two circles here. And it clearly shows the lead telluride phases, uh, rings corresponding to lead telluride phases. Now the same uh, film, when we try to in investigate, then we see that uh, as you increase the fluence, uh, there are nanostructure formations are there. So the morphology is actually changing to in a, a nanostructured surface. And uh, we have come across some uh, paper in Nature, which is cited there, Hogg uh, et al. in uh, 2008, that nanostructure formation lead to thermoelectric properties enhancement. And therefore, we expect that such kind of structures will have much enhanced uh, thermoelectric properties. So here, uh, this is the uh, left or right formation is proven uh, by uh, uh, Rutherford batch scattering also that uh, how they are mixing and all those uh, details are here. And uh, yeah, so uh, it is the same thing. Uh, and okay, additional information here is that in the beginning, uh, in the pristine, you had uh, uh, 0.17 uh, atomic percent of oxygen, but in after irradiation, it goes down to 0.12 percent. Whereas if you anneal it, then it actually increases, which is not desirable. So, which is the uh, key results uh, of a PhD students. And here uh, uh, on the electron right, we have carried out some uh, electrical conductivity, thermal power, and so on. And you can see the uh, top one right hand side curve that thermal power actually uh, uh, is shown that uh, uh, if you have pristine, then it's the bottommost curve. If you have annealed, then it's the middle one. And when it's irradiated, the top one. So you can see that thermal power actually has. Uh, tremendously increased by uh, ion irradiation. So this is the example of uh, ion beam mixing and uh, ion beam induced mixing. So uh, you have, let us say, antimony and uh, cobalt on a quartz substrate. And upper arrow shows that uh, when you actually anneal it, uh, then there is some alloy formation but then uh, not complete alloy formation. But if you have irradiate the same uh, sample at the bottom uh, arrow, then uh, there are a lot of defects created. And now after this defectization, if you anneal it, then it, there is a complete alloy formation. 
So he, this is the way actually, this is ion beam induced mixing and you get the complete alloy formation uh, uh, in some uh, experiment which I'm going to show. So this is the cobalt and, uh, antimony uh, bilayer and they are irradiated by uh, 10 to power 14 uh, ions per centimeter square. And uh, you clearly see that uh, you have uh, formation of cobalt antimony. Actually, cobalt antimony has uh, three different phases, COSB, COSB2, and COSB3. So uh, here you can clearly see that uh, uh, in the uh, top one at annealed at 400 degrees centigrade, you get uh, basically uh, the uh, COSB2 and COSB3. And the bottom most you have, uh, we are showing you that uh, the how the phase formation has occurred. And uh, there is some uh, uh, phase of antimony, antimony oxide also, which is coming up in irradiated any. Uh, annealed, but when you anneal it, then it is going, and it is showing that you have, uh, in the case of irradiation and annealed, the COSB3 percentage is quite high, which is very desirable because COSB3 is the uh, preferred phase of thermal electric uh, material. Uh, I mean, COSB and COSB2 are not that good for thermal electric applications from uh, literature point of view. Then uh, this is another uh, picture of uh, the uh, uh, same, sorry, QSB, uh, actually uh, here it is irradiated by low energy ions. And if you see uh, the uh, table below, it is showing that uh, QSB3, we are able to make 100%. That's what we wanted to show, that if we do irradiation with low energy ions, and it was some uh, 100 kV or 300 kV or xenon ions, and if you anneal it further, you will get 100% of QSB3, which is uh, of tremendous interest. And uh, with the Syncona XRD, we, have, we are able to show those, uh, uh, we, have, we are able to prove that we have a complete QSB3 phase in a particular case. Yeah, here, uh, actually, it is the same result, and it is proven by. Uh, Basically, uh, this is formed by uh, formation, uh, irradiation of 500 kV xenon ions on uh, cobalt antimony bilayer, and you anneal at 400 degree centigrade, that is schematic given on the top, you get this USB3 phase totally. And uh, you see that uh, this is nanostructure also, and as per the nature paper, this kind of uh, nanostructure thermoelectric uh, materials are having high efficiency of uh, thermal electricity. And the right-hand side is the Rutherford back scattering is uh, showing that the mixing has uh, taken place. So uh, this is confirming the SRD. So here, uh, the surface morphology is uh, shown at different fluences, how the surface uh, nanostructures are uh, uh, evolving at different uh, Influences, this is what is shown here. Now, with this uh, background on uh, with a little work on uh, thermal electricity, I just go to plasmonics to boost hydrogen generation by photoelectrochemical uh, process. And what is photoelectrochemical process? I explained at the beginning that in the presence of light, that's what the photo. The, uh, uh, some materials with water actually produces hydrogen. But before that, uh, one should have an idea of uh, the uh, surface plasma resonance. So if you have, uh, let us say, a metal nanoparticle, which is shown here by a sphere, and uh, when it is exposed to light, uh, the light is nothing but a uh, uh, combination of uh, electric and magnetic vectors. So when the electric vector, and these are oscillating, so when the electric vector is uh, upper side as shown here, there's a net electro cloud actually moves the other direction. And uh, this uh, goes the other way when the electric vector is reversed. And that is what is automatically happening in the light at a very high frequency of 10 to 14, uh, 10 to power 14 Hertz. So when the, uh, the frequency of the incident wave, uh, that's the light, 
matches with the uh, plasmon frequency of the metal particle, then there is a huge absorption of the light. And that is what is called surface plasmon resonance. And this is shown here on the left side curve, the bottom side, that the light suddenly it absorbed uh, uh, at certain particular wavelength. And this uh, plasmon frequency can be tuned by nature of metal. For example, uh, gold have a surface plasmon resonance at around 500, whereas the silver nanoparticles have around uh, SPR of around 400. And this also depends on the cluster size, the shape, separation between the two, and the dialectic metric where they are actually embedded in. So because of these three uh, uh, basically uh, parameters, one can tune the uh, surface plasma resonance. So here, uh, what is shown here is that uh, basically uh, it has been shown earlier that zirconium doped uh, iron oxide has been utilized for uh, photo splitting of water. But if we have uh, a gold layer uh, of a thin gold layer, which is nanostructure, either at the bottom or at the top, or it is sandwiched in between, then in all these cases, actually the uh, absorption of the light increases. And you have you get more of the uh, hydrogen coming out from the photoelectrochemical process. Uh, is there any question or query? Because uh, I see some sound. So, uh, may I request again uh, participants to keep uh, uh, themselves on mute? Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, the point is that when when you are shining the light, then uh, the gold layer actually are uh, producing electrons and they are uh, in the plasmonic state, then they are sharing this electrons with uh, uh, the material which is uh, adjacent to it. So now uh, the next example, uh, this is, I'm showing the uh, mechanism so I can skip this part. Uh, actually other strategy is that instead of top or bottom layer, you have gold nanoparticles embedded inside the matrix itself. So suppose uh, bismuth, penetrate and iron oxide are actually the good choice as a heterojunction junction for uh, hydrogen evolution. And uh, there are reasons to take this combination uh, and uh, I don't go into detail of that right now. But if the gold nanoparticles are embedded here, it is shown that again, that uh, generation of hydrogen is tremendously increased. So somebody is interested to uh, go through that and can go through this particular uh, reference given at the top. And now, they, what are the possible mechanisms responsible for enhancement of TC by gold nanoparticles? So there are three possible reasons, which are actually given here. So these are plasmon resonance energy transfer. So there is an overlap between the SPR spectrum possessed by nano, metal nanoparticle and the absorbance spectrum of the semiconductor, then it can happen. Or this is hot electron hole production. Uh, there is a the uh, direct there is a direct contact between metal and semiconductor, and this uh, direct contact is is equivalent to a short K barrier. And on light ex, uh, excitation, actually there is a hot electron uh, having enough energy which crosses the uh, the metal side and goes to the conduction band in the other side. And in optical enhancement, this is an increase in absorbance. Uh, and which causes actually the enhancement. So plasmonics also uh, actually, uh, it is in the previous example also, it was showing that it is actually inducing uh, photon induced current. But uh, then we are also showing here in another example that there are some materials, uh, let's say like uh, example, zinc oxide, and it's a very favorable material for uh, transparent uh, conducting oxide. If this zinc oxide is having some gold nanostructures inside this gold nanoparticle inside, then uh, under photon uh, uh, illumination, 
there is an increase in photo induced current and that has uh, very interesting implications and uh, possibility of applications so here it is shown that uh, we have made some gold zno nanocomposite which means gold nanoparticles embedded in zinc oxide matrix and it is made by uh, atom beam sputtering setup which is shown here so you have metal foil in in, in, in uh, yellow color and these matrix and the blue color which is in zinc oxide and by self assembly process actually uh, these sputtered atoms which are coming from the uh, target uh, this gold zinc oxide and the composite is formed and uh, that's a very detailed thing i am just uh, saying that it is formed by self assembly and in certain condition we get the morphology it is shown here that these are the zinc oxide rods and over which there are gold nanoparticles sitting on it so uh, the plasmonic property you can see on the right hand side so there is a uh, at around 500 uh, as for as the process there is a absorption at 500 which is typical for any gold nanostructure and which actually moves in uh, other direction and this spr peak intensity increases at uh, at different uh, engineering temperature so this were actually studied uh, for uh, photo switchability and what is done here that uh, uh, the iv characteristics is done with light and without light which is shown in that uh, top uh, left side so you can see without light uh, it's a linear curve and uh, the current is low but when you in the same thing actually the when you put the light on then uh, the current is much more so that means there is a photo induced uh, current inside <coughs> it and it is especially due to the gold nanostructure and uh, the inset is showing that uh, when you have no light then you have some current but when you put on the light uh, on a state then current increases and when you switch off the light again the current goes down and if you keep on doing many times then it uh, it is keeping the same characteristics that means it has a photo switchability but then uh, i mean there are reasons to explain that but right now i am uh, going that uh, the possibility of uh, use of such uh, uh, materials for uh, as a back electrode in solar cells because uh, in solar cells normally you use the tcos at the top and bottom and uh, if you have this kind of thing then uh, you have additional electrons coming in the picture so you have additional power coming in in uh, if you can produce more of electrons that means you are being able to have better efficiency so here now i take example of uh, nanometric graphite cylinders for dual cell application and this work has actually done in collaboration when i was in iuc delhi and in with bhu varanasi we are still doing certain things and uh, so here uh, on the top side we show that uh, you have a polymer which is irritated by ion so it is a, for a schematic purpose only one ion is shown then uh, corresponding to that there is a one track created and this track can be etched by uh, suitable etchant and uh, the diameter you get is in nanometer so it could be 20 nanometer 50 nanometer it can go to in micron size also and this uh, hole, uh, hole uh, hollow cylinder actually is grafted by another polymer which is having uh, interesting properties for uh, the uh, fuel cell so here it is shown that uh, uh, on the top side right hand side it is shown the assembly of the fuel cell and uh, in the center whatever you have is that 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 membrane which is created by the ion beam and etching and grafting so with the uh, use of uh, methyl alcohol and uh, water you get carbon dioxide and uh, you get the uh, basically electron the circuit that's what the cell is and uh, as a waste you have only water and uh, carbon dioxide and here it is shown uh the the uh, power density and the current density uh and on the bottom side again for nephion how it should be uh, normally nephion is generally used in commercial fuel cells so for comparison sake it is shown here 
role of nanostructures and materials for nuclear reactor. So here, uh, 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 what I wanted to share with you is that uh, uh, in nuclear reactor, there are materials which are used in, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, in the inside the, uh, uh, we are talking, we are not talking of the nuclear fuel, we are talking with structured material. And sometimes these structured material are certain oxide, zirconium oxide, for example. So now these uh, materials actually get damaged with the radiations. What kind of radiation? There will the, in the fission uh, because the nuclear reactor is based on fission. So you have a lot of fission fragments, which are typically 100 MeV uh, and 100 mass ions, which actually keep on hitting it and it amorphizes it, that material. And uh, this material is at high temperature also. So there is a need of testing such material outside because I, one cannot do such experiments in the nuclear reactor itself because uh, once it's an operation, it is an operation. But I want to test such thing and make better one. So I have to do some experiment in which that uh, probable material or the new design material is actually bombarded with fission fragment. And fission fragment is nothing but 100 MeV and 100 mass uh, ions, which are hitting the material. But at the same time, the temperature has to be uh, 100 K, say 800 degrees centigrade or so, because in the nuclear reactor, temperature is very high. So this, we had the project with the Department of Atomic Energy with BRC and IUC. And this kind of work is still going on. That uh, the, uh, in that project, we made one ladder in which the temperature can be raised up to 1000 K as, as it is shown here, heating stage and sample and all. And uh, when 1000 K is raised at that point, actually radiation is performed. So we are simulating the conditions which are there inside nuclear reactor. Outside, uh, outside the reactor, we are doing in the accelerator. So we are doing some test uh, experiments with that. And, one preliminary experiment is shown here. So this is uh, <coughs> one of the oxide uh, being considered by different groups, uh, GD2ZR207. And we have irradiated with the different influences and how it is uh, actually uh, amorphizing. That means the amorphization means that the uh, peak intensity is going down of the crystallinity. So on the right hand side, you see this is the another one, GD2 Ti207, in which uh, the black curve is showing that with fluence, it is getting amorphized. But when you when the temperature is high at 1000 K, the amorphization is taking place, but it is not uh, that much. So we are providing such information which were otherwise not possible uh, uh, outside. So this is. Uh, these are some interesting experiments going on. This is a very simple experiment I have shown. And now actually we are looking into the role of grain size in radiation stability for reactor materials, which is under in investigations. And there are some very interesting recent papers by our group, which I am not showing here right now. Uh, basically, theme is that when you go smaller in size towards the nano size, then the uh, stability of the material is better for low energy ions. Whereas for high energy ions, it is not that good. So now uh, we are trying to do experiments together and trying to see the overall effect, which is better, which uh, grain size is suitable. Now I come to the nanostructures in thermal sto storage. And here uh, we have tried to show that uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Normally, paraffin wax is used by uh, for thermal storage. That means uh, if you keep uh, paraffin wax in a box, in a metal box, let us say, if you keep in sun, then uh, if it's sun is strong, then wax will be melted. So, and so there will be a lot of heat, uh, which is actually stored as latent heat. And uh, if you want to use this latent heat when the uh, sun is not there, one can just pass through water and this warm water will come out from this uh, uh, through the pipe from the back. So these are the base, basically strategies and this is uh, such kind of things are being used by army in uh, in uh, Selchar and uh, the hilly, hilly areas where the temperature is always in minus, but the sun is strong, but then uh, temperature is always very low. So 
so uh, the roofs are uh, made of the uh, paraffin wax uh, i mean paraffin wax not just paraffin wax but then they are contained within certain uh, metal uh, box uh, metal pieces the metal boxes let uh, metal sheets and uh, they are the rooftops so here uh, we have shown here that uh, right hand side curve you see if i have just let us say pure paraffin then it takes around 12 minutes to go from uh, uh, solid state to liquid state so uh, then it is coming to horizontal the temperature is around 65 degree or so then it is horizontal curve that means with the time uh, it remains the same temperature remains same which means it is in a melted state then uh, it takes 12 minutes but if i uh, mix some uh, uh, nano materials in it then it reaches in a melted state much faster so that is what we are trying to show that the uh, the thermal storage heat can be uh, stored faster by use of nano materials and this experiment is done on a test piece which is on the rest uh, left hand side and uh, uh, this experiment was done when i was in mit with, with the faculty there uh, he is he uh, is a pi of one project which is uh, going on okay with this now i would uh, say something a uh, few lines on uh, ups that uh, our university is going very fast and uh, uh in last two years the publications actually have doubled so uh, so in a year we got thousand, more than 1000 publications which were hardly 500 or below 500 in every year and uh, then we have about 10 research funded projects going on by dsc srb dae ucos berak and so on and uh, we have about 80 patents and then we have access to indian and international research facilities and we have eight faculty of ups which are in top 2% of researchers of the world so this has created a big change in the university in, uh, in making the uh, research and innovation driven and uh, to add to it they, they announced in 2022 that uh, they will have 250 phd fellowships uh, for the phd students joining uh, so our own university will give the fellowship Uh, first six months, twenty-five thousand per month, which is, and after qualifying the uh, uh, the uh, clearing the uh, coursework, then it becomes thirty thousand. So this is uh, some uh, new things which are happened at the university and making it uh, go fast. Then these are our research focus areas, uh, which is aligned towards the government's mission and the UN sustainability goals, and. Uh, waste to energy we are doing lot of work on recycling of waste to plastic and maybe in the next lecture i'll be showing some slide on related to that sustainable energy and uh, water and environment detection of metal fluoride pesticides emerging pollutants remediation approaches health and health sector we have diagnostics and therapeutics nano biosensors early warning signals therapeutics smart membranes target drug delivery clinical research food agriculture medical plants robotics integration of ai and ml with devices this is the way we are going further uh, for improving our uh, biosensors modeling and simulation so and this is a summary of uh, what i have talked uh, here that uh, thermal electric thin films and uh, simulation and characterization in context of materials for energy and role of energetic ions in materials for energy Uh, hydrogen generation uh, nuclear uh, nuclear structure materials and so on so uh, here uh, this is the list of collaborators uh, uh, we are uh, uh, kalita shokan from uh, dehradun ps sa khan from ic delhi shashti du sk tripathi pu ps party finland by commissioner field university anuradha sathar in uh, agra Pramethi, BHU, Pawan Kulariya, JNU, Ekatyagi, Pinita from BRC, Vasant Sikarwar, MIT, and we at UPS look forward for international and national collaborations in plasma nanos, energy materials, nano biosensors, simulation, and any other areas which are for societal good. With this, I thank you. 
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I guess uh, I, uh, our participants have uh, are really enlightened with your session, and they have really got a deep insight in uh, nanotechnology and uh, energy applications. So uh, I can see a question here from uh, Dr. Veena Yadav. Which one is good for energy storage system, TNT or graphene? Okay. Uh, to be very frank, I have not done the experiment on graphene, so I cannot uh, comment on this. And uh, TNT we did for thermal storage and it improved. And graphene we have not tried. But uh, there must be information in the literature. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not, uh, uh, I have not come across that paper which, uh, which tells about there must be some work for sure. But TNT actually is uh, easily produced and uh, uh, more friendly, I mean, uh, cost wise, that's why TNT is preferred. And graphene production uh, is a bit costlier than uh, TNT. This is what I feel that uh, TNT has more uh, uh, choice for that. I mean, because in thermal storage, you have to use large number of it. But if you say that somebody says, I have a biosensor application, where you use very small material, and then there is a comparison between CNT and uh, graphene, and graphene is better. I will say go for graphene because uh, the amount required is very very small. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, dear participants, it is the end of our session one. Uh, I request all the participants to please uh, join again at one thirty p.m. For Professor Avasti's second session, uh, title will be Nanotechnology for Societal Needs. Uh, you can also post your questions later on in the second session because uh, I guess the time is already over yeah, and yeah, it's 11.30. Yeah. Yes, uh, so, uh, so we are ending the session here. Uh, you can check your mail IDs. Uh, yesterday, mails have been sent to all the participants and in that uh, mail, uh, you can find the uh, joining link for session two. Dr. So, thank Siti. you so much, everyone. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Siti. Uh, you said 1.30. I thought 12.30 is the session. So Can let me see? check with the schedule, sir. Yeah, please check because uh, I have something else at 2 o'clock. Uh, sir, can we make it 1? Uh, 1. Uh, uh, okay. I have to just check that uh, what time. Yes, yeah, uh, sir. Please, sir, okay. if you can. It should be possible, but then at two o'clock I have to, uh, I mean, uh, exit. Is that okay? Okay, so let us make it 12.30 as per your convenience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I request all the participants, please join the link exactly at 12.30. I uh, request all of you to please uh, be with the time. So thank you so much. I'm ending this meeting here. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, sir.